Uh, good evening everyone, thank you for being here. Um, my name is Hemant Chaturvedi. Um, a small introduction to me would be that I've been a cinematographer in the Bombay film industry for quite a while, a uh, little over 30 years now. And uh, last year I chose to move on from the film industry and uh, decided I didn't want to be a cinematographer anymore. In that process, uh, one ended up revisiting things one had done uh, over time, uh, things that had happened simultaneously. Uh, I think it, at some very early stage of my life, I realized that uh, while you stick to a profession and you do it as best as you can, there should always be some other things that you do that keep you alive in various ways. And I realized that today I can detach completely from 30 years in the film industry and be very proud of the work I've done as a traveler and as an individual uh, over these years. So, uh, Sanjana who runs Junoon, uh, Sanjana and Samira were very keen that I speak here. And I think she's been after me for about a year and a half and I've been so disinclined from speaking about my work in the film industry that I've been hemming and boying and you know, ducking and edging. And, uh, finally, Sanjana called me one day, three months ago, she gave me a date and she said, I don't care what you speak about, this is your date and you're coming. So I said, okay, fine. Um, I think I'd rather risk a kick in the backside, I would you know, say yes to Sanjana immediately. So I started thinking about what I could talk about. And I realized that I have done a lot of still photography and travel over the years. And it just turned out by accident, I think, not by design, that uh, most of the traveling I've done has been to places of faith. Um, I don't know how it happened. Suddenly when you look back on your 30 years of life, your life as a still photographer, you realize that you've been to almost exclusively places that have some religious foundation or the other. So the places that I'm dealing with today, uh, are some of the more, most important journeys that I've made in my life. Um, I'll start with a little place called Lonar. Lonar is uh, about 600 kilometers from Bombay. Um, it's somewhere near Aurangabad. It's very famous for a crater lake uh, and its Shiv temples. Uh, the crater was formed in uh, about 55,000 years ago by a meteorite that impacted the surface of the earth. I'll move then to a, a, a journey I made to Ethiopia uh, in the mid-2000s. 2009, actually, 2000s. Uh, followed by uh, the Kumbh Mela in 2013 and ending with Kailash Mansarovar, a trip that I did about three years ago. So I'd like to start with Lonar. Uh, Lonar last year was the place that uh, I find the journeys, uh, uh, I think one of the best ways to, was, as someone put it once, was uh, wherever you go, there you are, right? And once you reach the best, you know, you have to start getting your act together. As a traveler and photographer, I've always believed in spending five days in one place over, you know, uh, one day in five places uh, each time. So I was in Lonar for about a week. When I was making the booking on uh, the Maharashtra tourism site, it was quite funny when I entered six nights on the, the booking and I got a call from these people uh, and this lady says, uh, Sir, we've got a booking for six nights. So I said, yes. She said, but you're going to Lonavla. So I said, no, no, Lonar. She says, no, you're going to Lonavla for six nights. So I said, no, no, I'm going to Lonar. No, sir, the one near Khandala. I said, no, I'm going to Lonar, which is the meteorite place. He says, oh, sir, are you sure? Because no one in my entire experience has booked more than one night in Lonar. So he was there for six. So I said, yes, I am. And she was most abused. And she asked me what I did. I said, I was a photographer. And that's what I was doing. So the reason I'm talking about Lonar first is uh, um, I think I started getting a little uncomfortable with my work and with my life in uh, the Bombay film industry around uh, August last year. And I think it's always been very important to me, for me to just detach myself from day to day life and go somewhere unexpected where, you know, how do they, how do they put it, uh, the, the best way to think afresh is to be outside your comfort zone. And I found myself in Lonar, which is a very simple place. It was a, very tough drive through the monsoon of 600 kilometers uh, in floods and torrential rain and then when you reach there, you go forward. Uh, you come across this absolutely stunning place. Uh, Lonar is some, a place I wanted to go for for many, many years. And uh, so the basic background is that it's a meteorite impact crater. Uh, it's about 2 kilometers uh, across. Uh, it's about 200 meters deep from the, to the surface of the water from the highest point. It has 10 temples on the periphery uh, of the lake. 
That's one of them which is in the best uh, condition. It has two more very famous uh, temples on the outside. Uh, and as you can see, there's no one. You know, uh, unfortunately, Lonar is visited by geologists and scientists and meteorologists, meteorologists and uh, people testing the water, testing the soil. This temple has one uh, festival every year where people uh, kind of throng to it. Also. And that's the, the greater of its beauty. That is the first Shiv temple that I went to. Um, we go forward. This had the most amazing shivling. It looked like, uh, I think these temples were built around the 8th and 9th century uh, AD. And uh, what fascinated me about this shivling is something I've never seen. It looked like something out of a Superman comic. You know, it looks like it's been a shivling made on a slab of kryptonite. It was solid granite and carved only on one side. So if you took a circle around, it was just a flat piece of stone. So they actually, uh, you know, created this uh, stalactite kind of feeling on this thing. It's about this big. It's about five feet by about three and a half feet. This was a gentleman in uh, Lonar who retired from the Indian Postal Service. He was from Lonar, and he dedicated his life to this temple. He comes here every morning. He climbs down a half an hour every day. Spends time with the shipping, washes it. Does his prayers and carries on. That's what he does. Uh, he's kind of dedicated his entire life to the upkeep of this uh, temple. This was a round temple uh, in, in, the, in the crater. And what was really interesting about the place is that uh, you enter a, a, a cave of pillars, <clears throat> and the only thing you really see are the eyes, because they are painted with the white. And you see this halo. So you see these two eyes and this white halo painted behind the person. And as your eyes, uh, your pupils dilate, suddenly this whole murti comes into being. <clears throat> this is the murti up the close up. Uh, so while you're walking down to the crater, you keep finding these rocks from uh, from that era, uh, which have women pointing in a certain direction. So you basically follow the direction of the uh, the, the, in the in the direction of women are pointing till you find your way. This is an extra direction. I want to get that you would come follow it. But these work all across, either looking left or looking right, depending on the path that you have to follow. Which I thought very interesting how they created the sense of direction. So this is from the point of view of the Ram uh, uh, statue. And across you can see a Hanuman inside a little small temple. This is the, uh, the lake itself. Um, this is the, the tiger outside the, the Durga temple. Uh, the lake itself is saline, it has uh, no life in it, it grows, uh, it has a lot of what we call spirulina, a lot of villagers come here to collect water to cure skin diseases and uh, people come to bless themselves with it and use it as auspicious water and so on and so forth. And as always, uh, it's a saline lake two kilometers across and the moment you step out of the saline water and dig a hole to feed down you get the fresh water. And, uh, the, the, the meteorite, they say, landed at a kind of an angle. So it created a furrow and a ridge in the end. So in the far end is another uh, perennial source of water which is, uh, is, is sweet and fresh. And no one knows where the water comes from. It doesn't dry up in any season. It's also the highest point uh, in that area and no one has been able to source where the water is coming from. This one tried to take my camera from me, uh, so I think he deserved a portrait. That's the whole group. Next. This was another temple inside, another Shiv temple, um, which is very well looked after. Um, next. Next. So this was a very famous Hanuman uh, Murti in Lonar. Until about 40 years ago, uh, it's, it's supposed to be about six to 800 years old. This mandir had a giant orange rock that people used to come and worship. Till these uh, historians and uh, excavators came in from Europe, uh, having heard of a Hanuman temple in the vicinity, and they took permission from the owners of the temple to excavate the murti, the, the, the rock. So after two or three months of slowly getting rid of the surface, they came across this giant black granite Hanuman. The reason why the, the, 
it was an orange rock is that years of Sindur being applied to the rock it turned into one and the Murti it turned into one giant orange rock okay, so, so it's a Murti that's lying down and uh, they, put it, they don't let you in anymore so it's locked or grilled but they have a mirror on top that allows you to see the entire thing and of course there's the Rakshas being crashed at the bottom uh, next now we've come up to the uh, the Gomuk, the, the source of the water. Curiously, for the 8th and 9th century, there was a lot of uh, uh, Kama Sutra uh, uh, sculptures, as in erotic sculptures in many of the mandirs. This clearly is a very active moment in their lives. Uh, selfie moment, <laughs> every time. So there's the day that I was there uh, was the day that, uh, I think it was a Saturday when all the women from the local villages come to pray all the, the shivlings and pray there for uh, you know, uh, fertility and so on and so forth. This is where everyone comes to bathe. Uh, people collect water to drink from up there and they take it home. So the other temple I showed you by the uh, riverside is there in the distance right at the back. Uh, so you've now seen both perspectives from this end and from that end. Next. Boy, oh, I mean, the uh, standing. It's, it's quite a heavy weight of water that falls on these people. Next. There by the edge, there's not a sound barring uh, the sound of wind in the grass and, uh, and the birds in the distance. And, uh. So I think sitting here was when I realized I don't want to be part of the film industry anymore. I decided to come back to Bombay the day after and start fresh thinking all the things to do. And I think this is the last one. Dresses and names of people that you could write to. And there was this one girl who came to me from Ethiopia and somehow always wanted to go visit her country. The letters stopped coming in about 1978 79, so I assume the, the family had probably taken her as well. She was from a town called Axum and I'd always wanted to see Axum and go to Axum. So I found my way uh, to Ethiopia for a holiday. It was the most fascinating place. Um, I don't think I have been to a place that has, you know, on a, I think, almost hourly basis surprised me or you know, fascinated me. Um, I was in the land of Coptic Christianity. Uh, Ethiopia was the first country to adopt uh, Christianity in the first century. Uh, this is a place called Debre Gamos. It started by being called Debre Miriam and then it became Debre Davos. So the story behind this place is in the 6th century AD, a missionary came to Ethiopia and wanted to set up a monastery and a church. But he wanted a place that was secure, that would not be accessible to uh, people, who, to heathens, to you know, plunderers, to you know, people who destroy the church and massacre the, the, the Christians and so on. So while wandering around with the locals, he saw this plateau and decided that he wanted to make this establishment on top of the plateau. So the story goes uh, that when they reached the plateau, there was no access at all to get to the top. And uh, this serpent came out of the bushes and wrapped him in his coils and conveyed him to the top, uh, where he saw the, the, the top surface. 
This is what it looks like from the uh, top. It's the 6th century. I, nothing has changed since the 6th century. It's the same stones, same roofing, barring, uh, I think, a little bit of electricity and one green plastic pocket which you can't see. Uh, everything else is largely 6th century. So he saw this place after the snake brought him up. Uh, they created some steps to allow people to come with the building materials and labor and so on. And they built this church called the Church of Miriam, uh, Deborah Miriam. After the church was made, they realized they needed to destroy the steps. So, uh, to prevent access again, which was the intention of the place, so they destroyed all the steps. And it came to be called Deborah Davos, the church was of the broken steps. And uh, this place was absolutely fascinating. While uh, traveling here, a friend of mine, uh, a friend of mine told me that I must go to uh, Deborah Davos. He said, no, no, it's, it's, it's about uh, 70 miles from so and so, and it's, you can get there, you just have to climb up a rope, and it's a beautiful place, and you must go there. Of course, when you reach there, you realize that it's just a 70 foot climb up a rope. Uh, it was, I mean, there was a, a, a Spaniard, a Frenchman, and uh, two Spaniards and a Frenchman who might be friended. We'd uh, booked a car together to travel to this place, and all three of us are standing there, four of us. Looking at this 70 foot rope climb, and the Spaniard said to me, uh, he said, Hey, man, you know this saying in Spanish, which if translated means you can be ashamed and you can be afraid, but you should never be both together. So now that we're here, we better do this. So interestingly, uh, the rope, there are three ropes. One of them is used by the villagers to, and the missionary, and the, 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 the people who live here, the, monk, the monks, and so on to pull up provisions and water and so on. There is one rope that you have to pull yourself up with and there is one rope that they tie around your waist. Uh, the, they, of course, taking for taking it, uh, they, they understand that every pilgrim who comes here is not a, a mountaineer or a rattler or you know, a rope climber. The rope that they tie around your waist is held by one of the priests on top. He will not pull you up but he will never fall down. He just maintains the tension of the rope as you pull yourself up which you have to do. That actually represents the snake that took the first missionary up that many years ago. I'll just, so I'll just go back to the first picture of the tree. So after this really exhausting climb of you know lacerated hands and thighs and you know stubbed toes on the dog face etc. The first thing you see when you come up is this, and suddenly your entire mood changes and I think uh, you know your heartbeat finally comes down. And, uh, then as you go further, uh, this is the relief of the church, it's made with logs of olive wood and uh, granite and stone uh, that was broken. Uh, that is St. George's who was conveyed by the snake up to the mountain top. So they made these artesian wells, since it was all the way up there, they made these uh, excavations and created these wells that would collect rainwater through the year. And they're like bowdies, they have steps that lead you to the level of the water. Uh, next. This is from inside, that is one of the priests who was sitting and looking at me. Uh, I got a picture of him. These are my three friends that I climbed up with. Uh, okay, now, one of the most interesting things here was uh, there's a certain cliff face that you're taken to and you're allowed to hold on to uh, a rope and peep. And you see a sheer cliff face which has these little caves in them. So the legend is that these caves all house hermits. There are hermits who live in these caves. The church is responsible for giving them food and water at dusk every day. So there's a bunch of people who go with food and water on ropes and hand it down to each cave. The day a cave stops accepting the food and the water, you know that the hermit is dead. Strangely, uh, there is no access uh, if you look at the sheer cliff face, there is absolutely no physical access to these caves. And the head priest gets a vision when a new hermit has inhabited a cave that has been vacated. The point is that every new hermit who comes to live there has to live with the skeletons of the hermits who lived in the past. So this was the only one that because of erosion and so on was accessible. You can see at least four skulls inside and the fifth one outside. Um, no one knows who these hermits are. No one has ever seen them. <coughs> no one knows how they get there. They only know when they die and when a new one turns up. Next. Hey, oh. Interesting. 
interestingly, uh, uh, Deborah Ramos was also a place where I saw the swastika for the first time outside of India and maybe European history. Uh, over in, in Ethiopia, uh, uh, a swastika moving clockwise represents innocents and moving anti-clockwise represents sinners. So there is one church here, uh, I couldn't find that photograph but I will explain it to you. There is uh, the church of Lalibela. Lalibela was a monolithic uh, mountain church complex where they took a few hectares of rock like Elephanta was made and they, they would walk out the periphery of the, the space and then dig it out completely. It was absolutely fascinating. So King Lalibela in the 12th century had visited Jerusalem as a devout Christian and some years later was very disappointed to find that Jerusalem had been accessed, uh, annexed by the Muslims, had been captured by the Muslims and no Christian was allowed to go there anymore and he wanted to create the new Jerusalem. So Lalibela was created under the uh, grand auspices of King Lalibela as the new Jerusalem where people would come without fear and you know, come as pilgrims, come as travellers. I will go further. So the whole thing is just rock that has been cut through and you know, uh, uh, shaped and uh, smoothened and next. This was the main uh, Lalibela church, this photograph I call the Father, the Son and the Holy Ghost. So they have this very spooky Christ in the distance. Uh, it's actually huge, okay, for a monolithic structure it was about, what, 6,000, 7,000 square feet. Um, it had these pillars, it had these little inlets for light. Um, and you have this Christ in the semi-darkness inside these curtains and it's full of people being exorcised. Next. There's a lot of exorcism that happens, that's a priest sitting with his uh, staffs. Okay. This is a lady who I kept following around uh, as often as I could. She would go from church to church and get exercised. And exorcism next means basically this. Uh, the priest would rub her you know, body with the cross, with the Lalibela cross, which is also a historic thing. Sometimes they're you know, lying on the ground and flailing around and screaming. And the moment the cross would go, she'd put her shawl back on and she'd be completely quiet. Like she was in that previous photograph. She would just sit quietly for her turn and uh, Minutes later, she'd be screaming and wailing, and you know, this whole ritual would be uh, now would be an Okay. This is a nun, an Ethiopian nun, sitting outside her cave. Next. That's another nun. So you can see a swastika there as well. So this is the wall which I couldn't find the photograph of. It's, uh, it's the wall of one of the churches. It has a cross in the center and it has two swastikas moving anti-clockwise which is representative of Christ and the betrayers while they were crucified. And uh, there are certain instances where you will find the swastika moving clockwise as well which I will also show you. That's the typical arid uh, landscape of Ethiopia. So most of it is candlelit inside. When you walk into these caves, it's a lot of candles and uh, you know, uh, next. It's another priest. This was really interesting. You, you, you know, you walk innocently over a hilltop and the first thing you see is a priest and some nuns. And if you look carefully, you can see a cross at the back. Right? Next. And you're not expecting this, right? So as you come closer, you realize that it's, uh, it's this is the church of St. George's, the Dragon Slayer, which has been dug out of the ground. So they make this periphery first, they draw this periphery, then they dig out whatever they didn't need, then they would make doors and hollow out the entire structure. But in the history of Lalibela architecture, they always start by making the roof design of the roof. So they make a cross to start with, then they start excavating and following up. So that is how deep it is. So there's a whole series of catacombs and tunnels and steps and uh, uh, doors and uh, follows that you have to climb through and about. 
get here. This is a very, if you see the pattern on the windows, that became a very classic uh, style of uh, Ethiopian architecture and design, which is known as the Lalibela uh, school. Uh, all their crosses, a lot of their windows, even those artesian wells in that first place were the forerunners of that design. They came very close to it. And uh, next, that's the priest reading his uh, Bible. Okay. Now, this is very interesting. One of the legends this church uh, has is that sometime in the 13th century, there was a, a very large group of about 1,000 pilgrims who were traveling to this particular church. And about four or five kilometers before reaching here, the entire lot was massacred, mass right? They were all killed. Of by whatever it was, the priests wanted them to finish their journey. So they have, between four of them apparently, they have carried a thousand, people, thousand bodies to this place and they were buried at the back. So I couldn't bring myself to take a photograph of it somehow, but uh, if you went closer and you saw a torch, you could see the skeletons of a thousand people. Uh, wrapped in these red cloths, which are now more or less deteriorated. Some still have hair. Some of them still had hair, I remember. And uh, it's the biggest mass grave I have seen in my life standing before it. Uh, like, they have their own form of drums and music, and uh, 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 their architecture is unique to. Uh, again, you see that same form. That's across the window, like coming in or the door. That was a light falling on a donation box with a cross on it. That's the priest. That's it. So I'd say Ethiopia was one of the most moving uh, places I've been to. Um, I don't think I've been to a country where there is so much poverty and so much, uh, uh, you know, so much lack of everything. It was very interesting in Addis Ababa to notice that there were very few people of my age. Either people were in their teens and early twenties or they were 55 and 60 and above. The reason being that that large generation got wiped out by the famine. So they either have very old people or very young people. Um, they were the most generous people that I have ever met in my life. They were the most affectionate, the most warm. One of the nicest things about uh, uh, Ethiopia was one of the police laws they have on the streets. Where if you have an accident of any kind, by law both the drivers are expected to go and stand on the opposite side of the road. They are not allowed to engage. The moment they engage they are arrested. So there is no argument allowed in public. Uh, if I remember correctly, the year I was there, there the crime rate of Addis Ababa had been one pick pocketing. <laughs> and the legend was the guy didn't know whether his, his pocket had been picked or he just lost his wallet. You know, he wasn't quite sure. Uh, it was just really the most calm and the serene and the most beautiful place I've been to. The only disappointment there were the, believe it or not, the Rastafarians. It was very interesting, you know, one has read so much about them, you know, one has heard pop Mali and reggae music and read about all these things and you're expecting to meet a few Rastafarians there and you end up doing it, you meet them. With my long hair in those days I used to be in shorts and t-shirts so I was I guess a Rastafarian in making. But the first thing was meeting these people and it was the biggest disappointment because they were all just 
other than that, a peace, respect, brother, man, it was all drugs and pimps and pushers and, you know, they were just trying to steal your money and they were trying to, you know, sell you rubbish and, you know, get you into trouble and, uh, I in fact wanted to get a line of Judea on my arm as a tattoo in Ethiopia, but I ended up with an angel from my Judea from the same uh, country. Uh, they were the most amazing places that I went to, you know, these, these churches were actually stunning. The people who just devoted to Christianity and, you know, uh, this is again, this is Lake Tana. Lake Tana is a 90 kilometer by 66 kilometer lake. And that's a flock of pelicans, uh, pelicans sitting on the middle of the mound. Um, it's amazing, you know, you get onto that little boat and it's like being on a sea. It's infinite water. It's, uh, so the Lake Tana has a whole bunch of churches, each of which is supposed to hold a, a relic of Christ. Uh, the churches are circular, in, you know, for some reason. I'll go forward. Uh, So this is one of the most impressive churches that I saw. Uh, this was an oval church uh, made of stone and limestone and uh, bamboo and reeds and uh, hatched roofs. So when you enter the church, uh, there's a room in the center that's square, which has one door. The walls of that church have uh, the birth, the death and the resur resurrection of Christ painted on them. <coughs> So another thing that I learned from uh, the, the art, the, the frescoes in, uh, these, uh, in these church paintings was that whoever is depicted with both eyes is an innocent and anyone who is in profile and only one eye visible of is a heretic or a sinner. So King Herod and King Herod's army will always be in profile and uh, every other person, every other innocent would be with both eyes visible. Um, all the kids have amazing hairstyles. They all have the mohawks and the cornrows and you know. And they know nothing about the world, they do. I think one of the funniest things that happened at uh, that Debra Davos when I had to climb up the rope. Uh, it's next to a village and there were children there from the village who were so used to climbing up that rope. You know, by guys struggling to <coughs> you know climb five feet, there were kids that have gone up and down ten times and they were very used with us. So there were a couple of kids who spoke English. And they were laughing at me when I was struggling to climb the rope. And after I came down, I sat down and said, Okay guys, I'm going to take you to Bombay. And I'm going to take you across the Western Express Highway in Russia. Okay, <laughs> let's, let's see a trade-off. The road that I can't climb would be the road that you can't cross. So, I said, So the Ethiopians used to be uh, worshippers of the moon. This is a church called the Abune Akse Church. This is from the 6th century AD. Next to it, uh, which I don't have photographs of today, was the, is probably the oldest standing uh, structure in Africa. 
which is from the 5th century BC, which was the the Yeha, the church of Yeha, the temple of Yeha, which is very, very famous. And uh, now it's in a ruin, of course, but there are some parts of it that are still standing. <coughs> what is interesting is that uh, when the Christian missionaries came here, they started preaching Christianity. So people started uh, become, uh, converting to Christianity. The temple of Yeha was then used as the first church in this area. One of the things that my guide told me was the place where they used to make animal sacrifice uh, during the days of the moon worship became the pulpit for the uh, priest to give his sermons uh, because it was a slightly elevated structure and it gave him height to be able to talk to a lot of people. At some point when they managed to raise the funds and uh, have the wherewithal to build a church, they built this church. And since there was sun, moon and uh, sun and worshippers at the ibex bowl, if you see a little panel there, of, that's ibex boats. Um, there are parts of the church that have been designed with the sun and the moon throughout. So they built this church, keeping uh, uh, in mind the respect they had for the culture that they had you know, taken over. This was really interesting. I, you know, I wandered through this door and I climbed some steps and. I see this wall and I see this person sitting there with his stick. So I decided to take a photograph. That's what you're there for. You know, you're soaking in the country and taking lots of pictures, and it was a perfect picture at that point in time. I took a photograph and he moved and he said something. And I asked my driver if he was objecting to me taking a photograph. He says, No, he's blind, he's been in this, he's 80, no one knows how old he is, but he's been here for about eight years. He's blind and he doesn't mind at all. So I took another couple of pictures and he said something again. So the driver said, sir, he wants to wants you to come closer. So I went closer and this priest mumbles something in his language. I am told that I have to sit in front of him and that he wants to touch my face. So I've sat down on the floor in front of him and uh, put the next picture. Now I am this close to him. He touches my face, he touches everything, he gets a little confused between my long hair and my beard. Uh, touches my eyes through my glasses, he does, spends a good five minutes doing this. And then starts mumbling, uh, non-stop, as he mumbled and mumbled and mumbled and mumbled. And suddenly he just shut his eyes and he rolled back and went to sleep. So I asked my driver, Viranu, uh, I said, Viranu, what is he saying? Seems to have said a lot. So it turns out this gentleman had said that uh, tell the person whose face I am touching here today that he is a very honest person and honesty is not a great virtue in today's world. <laughs> it is very easy for a dishonest person to trust a dishonest person. But a dishonest person cannot trust an honest person. Tell him that he should continue doing what he thinks is right and victory will be his. And he went to sleep. So it's one of those eerie moments that happen on the blue. And uh, when I came out of the temple, he called. He wasn't there. I wanted to speak to him a little more, but he by then got up and left. And this is local lending library in the market of uh, Aksu. There was this uh, <laughs> This is one of the friends I made, uh, that's the uh, Lake of Queen Sheba and uh, this girl had never eaten chocolate before. So one of my friends there told me that I should always carry a lot of chocolate with me because children love chocolate. And you know, it's such a rarity that they get, you know, a square meal. The chocolate is, uh, you know, a 
like a huge treat. So I gave her a Mars bar that I picked up in the market over there, and she saw it and didn't know what to do with it. So I taught her how she has to open the wrapper and eat what's on the inside. I turned around to take a photograph of something and came back and she was gone. I found her hiding behind the rock with this little bit of chocolate book, trying to shred that wrapper and you know with this look of absolute delight. And I had another bag full of chocolate when I just gave it to her. Next one. This is one very sweet girl who took me up to this uh, Panthalasa church. Uh, she was selling trinkets of all kinds and uh, she spoke a little bit of English somehow and she insisted on accompanying me for the whole trip all the way up to the hill and to the church and uh, saw me all the way back and she got the rest of my job. So I am from Allahabad, UP and uh, I am 48 and a half years old. So my first home was in 1977. Um, I must have been about 8, 9 years old then. And I have been to all the homes since. I have been in 77, 89, 2001 and 2013. In 77 of course I was too young to carry a camera so I didn't. In 89 I was there with a bunch of college friends. In 2001, I was there with a bunch of friends and one of the things I've learned about taking photographs while traveling is to travel alone. I think, uh, you know, it's just impossible to be with a bunch of people and do your own thing and there's a certain meditative process in photography that, you know, cannot be pressured by someone else wanting to do something mundane which seems mundane to you at that point of time. So while I did take a few photographs in 1989 and 2001, I wasn't really concentrating because I had to meet people. So 2013 was the year that I decided that I should just go there on my own. I have home there, so it's fairly easy. It's about 8 kilometers from the Sangam. Um, every day you wake up at about 4 and walk 10 kilometers to the Sangam. Um, the Kumbh Mela 2013 was one of the most highly attended Melas. In the period of a month and a half, it is estimated that 120 million people came and went from Allahabad. On a day in January, which is called the Mauni Amavasya, had a record of 30 million people between dawn and dusk who have come to, between dawn and dawn, who came and took the auspicious dip in the Sangam. This is early in the morning. Um, everyone knows the history of the poem, uh, how those Samudra Manthan happened and the Amrit was removed from the poison and four drops of Amrit was spilt into Jain Nasik, Bharat uh, Matwar and Baba, which is where the Kumbh Mela happened. Uh, all of us know that there is the mythical Saraswati that joins the uh, Ganga and Yamuna. Standing in the sun is very interesting because in, in, in the months that the rivers are full, you can actually see a distinct line that creates a difference in colour between the two rivers. The Ganga happens to be a lot browner and the Yamuna happens to be a lot greener. So there's a very distinct line that happens. And most of the photographs that people see of the comb is apparently of the sadhus and the nagas and you know people rushing into the water and uh, being aggressive on camera and naked and uh, violent and with withered hands and you know uh, performing all kinds of these amazing feats of, of, of human endurance. I decided that I just wanted to be with the people. You know, when uh, a lot of my friends who have seen these photographs before were very surprised to see that they were seeing, actually seeing a side of the poem they'd never seen before, you know. You always talk about 120 million people but you only see sadhus, you know, that's because they're so excited to shoot and they look so good in the photographs that, you know, people in Berenby end up just shooting these sadhus. So I decided to do what I felt the poem was about, which was a large number of people coming to this spot every few years with a single focus, which was a dip in the Ganga, in the Sangam. And they suffer, and this happens in the winter, and Allahabad touches about 1 degree in the winter. 
Uh, they come with minimum apparatus, minimum clothes. Uh, they'll be sleeping on the banks of the Ganga at the night. They just come there for that day, they have their bath and they leave. Uh, for me, it's been one of the most amazing experiences. Uh, each home in its own way was fascinating. I think I was finishing a movie uh, just before I went to the home this year. And we were shooting this very big song which had some 300, 400 people on set. And someone came to me and said, Hey, but sir, I believe you're going to the Kum. I said, Yes. He said, But sir, let's look at the crowd. How will you deal with the crowds? So I said, Look around you. I've been trained by Bollywood. You know, there's always thousands of people on set. You know, the Kum will probably be a lot easier. And it is, because everyone is there with the focus. It is the most silent 30 million people I've ever been with in my life. Uh, everyone is there with complete peace and, you know, a uh, sense of purpose. The purpose is very simple. The peace is all encompassing. Um, are they? It's just people with faith, that's it. You know? Basically, anywhere, uh, they're just happy to be there. I've never heard a raised voice. Uh, I've never heard a provocation. And yes, 50 people died in a stampede, but I mean, honestly, to be perfectly frank, you know, 50 people out of 120 million is a very small proportion. This is a typical family uh, at home. One of the downsides of the Kum is a lot of families bring their very old parents and leave them to die. Um, hoping that the cold and the lack of food and water will kill them. There have been situations where the parents have managed to get to the police, remember their villages, have gone back to the village in a month to find the properties being distributed and you know, things have been sold and everything has just been finished. <laughs> so just imagine, you know, that that number of people each with an individual but common purpose. You know, she is equally happy sitting there on her own. You know, with her two and looking through a few cars and you know, rolling. And she's she's complete. She doesn't need anything else. The difference between the poems that I have seen over the years has been uh, very specific actually. The facilities have just become better and better. It is one of the most smooth experiences that you could encounter. Until uh, 2001, <coughs> It used to be more of a mela when you walked to the sangam. So you'd have a circus tent, you'd have you know conjurers, haluwalas, madaris, uh, tightrope walkers, uh, you know nut. ये सब हुआ करते सब पहले सब होते थे। इस साल में जाने क्यों उन्होंने इन सारे लोगों को एक दूसरे मैदान पे बैठा दिया। अब हुआ क्या है कि वो मेले की रोना चली गई। अब आप सीधे जाके डुबकी मार के घर चले जाओगे। अब उनका धंधा � so that was really sad because it used to add a lot of color to the poem and I find this time that color was missing, you know, that you know that distraction of stopping and looking at something and you know participating in something. I remember in 2001 one of the strangest things that I've ever seen and I've looked um, at every opportunity that I've got. There was a, a tent that had a crowd sitting inside it. In the center of the uh, uh, tent was a square uh, uh, cage made of mesh, a thick mesh, so you could see through completely. There was a girl inside who must have been about 16 or 17 years old and the cage was full of reptiles, snakes, monitor lizards, uh, geckos, chameleons, uh, every possible kind of reptile. And her job was to pick it up and touch the mouth of that reptile to her mouth. Sometimes even hold the reptile with her mouth, with the body hanging from it. I never understood the purpose of that uh, particular activity, but it seemed to get a lot of it, you know, a lot of uh, attention from the crowd. Um, the, that particular cage, the tent was very dingy. I didn't manage to take any photographs. It was the days of film. And I think all I had was 400 AC film at that point in time. But I never found that again. I never found that again. 
the funniest, uh, I think the only moment of comedy that happens at the Kumbh Mela, which is the announcements that are made over the microphones from the Bhula Bhatka Shivir. The Bhula Bhatka Shivir is basically where lost people go and gather. So the, the announcements can be as bizarre as, Aray, Munnu, Munnu ki mammi bol rahe hai. Aray, Munnu beta, aap baithe hai, yaha bhule bhatti sivir mein. Yaha aap to. So it will be as simple as that. One chap, I remember, said ki, Bhaiya, hamaari patroon dho gai hai, patroon mein phone dho gaya hai. Aap patroon mein sab rakh lije, lekin phono aapko dhar ja dije. So all kinds of things, the only absolutely and totally enjoyably comedy, comedy moment in the thing is this constant Bhula Bhatta Shivir happening on the, the megaphones. Other than that, I'm... That's what it looks like uh, from the fort. Uh, this is the military camp, all the way here. This is where all the bathing happens. That is the other section um, where people stay and uh, that's the sunset over the Shastri Pur. That's Sai Baba looking over, presiding over the evening. So this is how they sleep, they just find the spot and all of them gather together. I think they survive because of body heat, because they, you know, uh, sleep in piles of people uh, as close to each other as possible to each other. And uh, that's the sun in the distance, you can see the water reflecting, the lights reflecting in the back. So it's thousands and thousands and thousands of people that sleep like this sometimes. Uh, this is the Ganga Aarti, there's a family from Chok that comes and does a Ganga Aarti every day. So the priest, he's the priest of the Paranji, he comes and likes these lands. This is Shankar Aarti, this is what? Shankar Aarti. This is the last.
purified. Uh, Kailash itself, you know, so many stories have been written about it. You know, the thunder was being danced there, the the dhamru was from there, the tissue was being flung from there, uh, Ardhanareshwari has happened there, you know, Rakshas, upon Rakshas has been you know, destroyed. It could be just a mountain, you know, but you're looking at it with this entire history of, of fact and fiction and mythology. And so these are, uh, uh, since there are a lot of Tibetans uh, in t Tibetan Buddhism and Hinduism in uh, Tibet, the Tibetans actually, uh, when a person, a, fam a family member dies, they take a yak head and they carve Om Mane Padme Om on the skull and they leave it in memory with a tablet of scriptures. So there were these places where you would find up to 500, 800 yak heads, you know, and plaques and stones just lying in the uh, for example. So that's the inscription on the forehead. That's just a bunch of plaques that would have Buddhist um, uh, scriptures and insignias and mandalas and all kinds of things. <clears throat> this is another example. This was a very difficult photograph to take. It took me about uh, an hour in the night. And I still have a part of my right foot that's down from the cold. I think it was minus 16 that night. This was a 20 minute exposure. And which is why the clouds are moving uh, the way they are. One of the great challenges of traveling to Kailash was not the physical hardship, it wasn't the lack of facilities uh, that one is more or less prepared for. What was absolutely fascinating was the fact that you have to travel with 23 other people who you don't know. And much as. Much as, as an individual you think in a situation like this the destination is more important than the journey, the other 23 people find enough fault with the, with the journey to not have any respect for the destination. So we had lots of fun actually, you know, sit back and stop getting irritated by them and enjoy them for the, the viewer they provide. I must tell you some of these anecdotes which are in my mind fairly amusing. With one, when we crossed over from <coughs> Nepal to Tibet, you have to cross through a Chinese check post where they look at your passports and frisk your luggage and do whatever they need. There was a Hyderabadi couple in their late twenties, that was a husband and wife. So all twenty-four of us have crossed over to the other side where you get a new bus and a Chinese guide and a Chinese driver. And everyone's on the bus except for these two people. Okay, ten minutes go by, twenty minutes go by. Thirty minutes later, husband and wife saunter up to the bus and get on. So someone said, Why are you going? So the wife says, Nay, I'm not China, China, but Gusa and those Sasta mobile are good rather. So Jada, China, but mobile are Sasta Vinegar. So they were hunting for cheap cell phones. I said, We might have gotten cheaper at Chakra. It probably much easier. Anyway, then the journey kind of begins, and you're going through landscapes like this, and you know, there is a certain kind of person that gets elevated by the, 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 the beauty that they're experiencing. There are some people who are still jumping about the most basic things. Now, I had, I had kind of had a... Uh, one of the big downsides of traveling like this, you can't stop whatever you want to. Okay, I'm so used to traveling on my own, where you just park, or stop, get off, take your pictures, spend, if you want, two days. You know, sometimes three days. And then carry on when you're exhausted. But here I am with, you know, 23 other people. Uh, I, I kind of had a setting with the driver who quite liked me, the Chinese guy. So I used to buy him uh, two cans of beer every day so that he would pretend that either he needed to pee or I needed to pee so that we could stop wherever we wanted to. This is one example where both of us decided we needed to pee and it was gone and uh, the sun had just risen on the left and these industrial wires, the pylon wires were catching the light all the way you know, and these beautiful dunes of sand uh, and then we Carry on and we reach this uh, one of the first uh, places that we're supposed to stay. Now, to the credit of, to, of the tour operator, he's he's primed us very meticulously on uh, what we're going to get to eat, you know, what we're going to get to sleep on. Uh, you're supposed to carry your inners and socks and you know whatever you can to keep yourself warm. And khichdi, okay, khichdi is what you're going to get because they carry the food with them and they cook it on the spot. There are three sherpas who look after you. So there were these three Bengali gentlemen who were traveling with us. 
Uh, remarkable people. One of them was 71. The other two were approximately my age. And they were mountaineers by habit. So every year they do two expeditions, just three of them. And this year they decided to come to Kailash. The first day that we sat down for lunch at this uh, uh, Dharamshala, it's Thali is being served to everyone. And the servings are erratic, right? Everyone doesn't get exactly the measured amount. So one of the dadas got a little angry. He got pissed off and says, Hey, Shepa, is that? Hey, uska thali me do tho guli hai, hamara thali me ek tho ka hai. Abhi hum bhi taka diya hai, hum ko bhi do tho guli chahiye, usko bhi ek tho ka hai. So these three were constantly bickering with the Shepas, I think, throughout the journey. Uh, to my own reason, I was most of it, by the way. Shishwarya and I found the way to the most <laughs> obscure place on the planet. <laughs> The next one is closer. There she is. I mean, you can, you can, you can't find a, you know, a, a geo position for this place. But next time we arrive, it's found itself mirrored. This is now the Mansarovar Lake. This is about the monasteries uh, in the vicinity, and uh, it was just. Absolutely stunning. Of course, when you see something like this, the first impulse is to want to go to the other end, which is the top. So, when you see that man sitting there, you want to be where he is. You wonder what he's thinking. So, and there you are. That's the view of the entire Mansur over today. Um, the day we reached, uh, the bus does the paritrama for you. You're not allowed to get off. Um, they've come and parked at a certain spot, which is uh, in the south end of the lake where you see the Kailash right in front. So my entire bunch of people got very excited and suddenly, you know, all these puja samagri came out and all the bells and the, the agribhaktis and the ki and you know, this whole puja thing started happening. Everyone was very upset at me for not participating. I kind of backed off from this uh, this noise and I went wandered off with my camera. And I decided to do this, uh, do the dip when I was in a better frame of mind, not in this jamboree. So I have woken up the next day after spending the night taking photographs all across this place as much as I have access. And it was a nice bright sunny day. It was very cold, about I think one or two degrees. And I walked up to the lake and uh, put my toe in it and realized it's really, really cold. It's probably just a degree from freezing. So I thought I'd do the easy thing and just dip my hand and sprinkle water all over me and consider my pollution is complete. And then suppose something in your mind says, you know, you've come all the way here. The least you can do is go into the water. So I took a deep breath and I just, I think the only way to do it at that point was to stride into the water. So I strode into the water and I reached my, I think the water was up to my chest. And it was the coldest water I've ever been in. I don't know what happened at that point of time. Uh, there was a, a lapse in my in my consciousness, I think. I heard a voice calling my name and at some point I broke out of this reverie and I turned around and I saw one of those Bengali gentlemen sitting there saying, Hemantara, you've been in the water, I've been sitting here for 25 minutes, you've been in the water from before I got here, so I think you should come out now, otherwise you probably you know, you'll be done. So I don't know what happened to me, I was drinking the water, I was standing in the water, all I could hear was the, you know, the lapping of the water against my body. I could hear the wind in my hair, I could hear uh, ears, I could hear uh, there's a species of duck that is prevalent there called the Brahmani duck. You could hear them flapping around and quacking in the distance. Simultaneously during the journey, uh, I was reading a book which I found in a very nice bookshop in Kathmandu. It was called Kailash Mansarova and was written in the 1940s by Swami Pranavananda. So Swami Prabhupada has probably lived the life that I would like to live, which is he was a geologist, botanist, cartographer, scientist, uh, uh, spiritualist, yogi, uh, ascetic, what do you name it, he was, he, was, he was all of it. He's the first person to have charted the land around, uh, understood the depths of all the lakes, uh, studied the flora and the fauna, the geology, the you know, um, the, the strata of soil, the, I mean he was the, 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 the beginning and end of everything scientific that you know about Kailash Mansur. 
he talks about uh, how he spent six months living on the banks of the Mans River, which to me is probably the most astounding thing a human being could do. And he speaks in that book of a point in March where they're fast asleep on the banks of the Mans River, which is frozen solid. Okay. In the book, he writes about how you can walk across the lake because it's such solid ice, and you can see shoals of fish frozen in the water, and you know all these other very surreal sights with the phosphorescence, you know, uh, from the rocks. And so he said he was fast asleep one night, and somewhere near dawn, they suddenly were awakened by these absolutely horrifying sounds of thunder. What sounded like thunder? And they all woke up in a panic and came rushing out of their tents to discover that the only thing happening was the ice on the lake had started to crack. So when you have a six kilometer crack on a, on, on, on a lake of ice, you know, you hear that little crack in an ice cube in a, in a glass of whiskey, you know, when you hear. He said it was, he said, 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 it was so beautifully put. Uh, how he's travelled, he did, I think, an unlimited number of parikramas of uh, uh, the Kailash. And uh, that's the life I'd like to lead. I wish you know, governments would allow people like us to do these things. Go and spend six months by the banks of the Mansur would be fantastic. So long as I have a charger for my camera, I think that's <laughs> fine. So I timed my trip. Uh, it was the Almost one of the last trips that happens, uh, tours that happens to Tibet. I had timed mine to be at the Mans Rover on the night of the full moon. So I had backtracked from the full moon base. This is actually the full moon rising over the Mans Rover Lake. Um, I could have sat here for hours, you know, and it's interesting how, in that level of rarefied atmosphere, the moon is so bright that you can't look at it with your naked eye. It's just so dazzlingly bright. And this is what I call my, my haiku mode. The cloud just came along and. Uh, that's the same monastery uh, the next morning. This is the Kailash. This is the south face of Mount Kailash. Again, I, have, I think I can't really describe what it feels like to have spent seven days in that bus journeying towards this destination. And the moment you go over that, that hillside, and you suddenly see that expanse of blue, which is the Mansur over. And then, as the bus goes further to the west, to the to the west, and as you have revelations from the mountains, you suddenly see the Kailash. And there it is, uh, absolutely fascinating. You know, this, there's a school of thought that believes it was built by aliens. It's a pyramid built by aliens. Uh, there's mythology and, and you know, uh, myth of, I mean, I have no, there's no, there's no way of not being right That's the Kailash again, which goes on prayer flags. And the journey begins. So the parikrama of the 52 kilometer trek around the Kailash begins from here. And it's about 18 kilometers that you have to cover on the first day up to the base camp, where you can actually see the Kailash. The second day is the most difficult, where you have to climb to a certain height. Most of, the, most of that day is upwards. And on the third day is down the plains and back to where you started from. Now, actually, it's just, it just goes more and more spare as you go further and further. You see fewer and fewer people. I mean, I did the Kumbh Mela and this in the same year, you know. And I think there are more people per square foot of the Kumbh than there are in Tibet, you know, as a population. That, this gives you a sense of the scale, the three people walking the distance, that's how big the mountains are. Um, <coughs> the rare local people that you see, two ladies. So there are many kinds of parikramas also. The one we do is on foot over three days. There's one that is done in a single day, uh, which takes 24 hours and not many people are capable of doing it, but it's considered one of the greatest parikramas that you could possibly uh, finish. The third one is the more complicated one, which is the Shashtang uh, thing, where you, you lie down on the floor, 
stretch your hands, and you say a prayer, you stand exactly where your hands are reached. And then you lie down again, and you say a prayer, and you do that for the entire 52 kilometers, up hill, down hill. Every hand people do it. There are locals who do it. Uh, these two ladies were on a uh, one day for um, So this of course is the Ganesh, the rock that is dedicated to Ganesh. Uh, it does look a bit heavy. Then uh, you reach. It's again, I, you know, I, even when I think back on the day that I was standing right in front, I have very few words to describe how you feel. Again, like I said at the beginning, it's a combination of how much you've read, how much you've been exposed to. You know, every every piece of music, every piece of literature, every piece of mythology that comes back to you and gives this mountain that kind of value that you would not otherwise give for physical space. And this is from Dharamshala that we were staying in. There was a river flowing on the right. Uh, the river actually meets, there's another river that flows from here, but this one had kind of dried up. So these two meet and then they carry on. Um, I have not known such, uh, between Mansarovar and Kailash, I don't think I have understood tranquility as well as, or experienced it as meticulously as I have done over here, where you actually understand what it feels like to be, uh, you know, that cliche of being a cog in the machinery, you know. Uh, this was just a lucky moment, I found a pile of rocks uh, with a shawl wrapped around them, which looks like Buddha praying to Kailash. So I, uh, when I woke up on the second day, the first night we spent in this Dharamshala. When I woke up in the morning, uh, I actually tried to stay awake all night because I wanted to catch uh, some photographs of Kailash in the full moon that I had you know, managed to find. But it's just one of those days, one of those nights that it was lavered over completely and I had a, my bed was close to the window, the window was open, I could see Kailash. But all I could see was this vague whiteness because of the clouds. So anyway, I woke up in the morning and I got dressed to start the second day of the Parikrama. And something in my head said I didn't want to do the Parikrama, I wanted to do something else. I also realized that on the second day when you take, maybe, you know, when you walk for about 20 minutes, you lose sight of the Kailash completely. And somehow that wasn't seeming right for me at that point of time. So I decided to do something else. Uh, it would be interesting to note, however, that out of the 24 people who had begun the journey, only four of us, five of us had reached. Okay, 19 people had fallen by the wayside. Uh, injury, uh, exhaustion, altitude sickness, needless bravado, which the Hyderabadi couple had shown. Uh, the, the guy was the first one to tank out completely. Uh, because he was a little stuck, he didn't want to wear a jacket, he didn't want to wear an inner, so he got the chills. But I decided that I wanted to walk all the way up and go and touch the mountain. Which is not something that many people have done, and not too many people do, because you're also obsessed with the parikrama and the difficulty of it that you end up doing what everybody else does. Next. So I've actually then walked up. Uh, this is the close up of the same image that we saw before. So I climbed, it took about four hours to reach up to here. It took me another hour to walk all the way up to there. There was, I think, the first time in my life uh, that I've been in a place of such magnificence and not wanted to take a photograph. Just the moment I crossed this threshold into this dunes of snow, I just felt the experience was so personal that I didn't want to share it with anyone. In images, I didn't want to look at it as images myself. Because it was so special that it will never leave, you know, my body or my mind or my consciousness, consciousness. And when you walk through this whole thing, you know, it's now out from here, you get all the way across there. It's just white. It's just white everywhere. And I kept my iPod charged with the uh, beautiful version of the Shiv Tandav's growth that I had planned very meticulously to meticulously to sit at the you know foot of the mountain 
put my headphones on, listen to it, but I think at minus 10, I thought it frozen solid. So it didn't run at all. Uh, but it didn't need to again, you know, it was just amazing. Uh, this is the last photograph I took uh, before I entered there and then I just put my hand over it. Uh, but you're standing there and looking up at this, you know, two and a half thousand feet of, you know, mythological rock. It's just absolutely fascinating. And I must add that uh, when you wake up in the morning in a place like this, this is one of the anecdotes of my co-travelers. You know, you've, you've had a very tough day walking those 18 kilometers. You're full of feelings and emotions and thoughts and, you know, your mind is, you know, going all over the place. You're feeling a sense of spirituality and, you know, peace and calm and tranquility and, you know, elevation. And you spend the night gazing at the kalash through your window and in the morning you wake up and it's not even dawn. You're standing on your balcony, you can hear the sound of the river, you know, you can hear the wind, you can see this phosphorescent mountain and, you know, just when you're about to lapse into a trance of pure happiness, you suddenly hear, <coughs> Mr. Srinivas has woken up and decided to hear his plan. It was so annoying, it was so annoying, you know, the moment of absolute bliss, you know, rudely interrupted by a phlegm. <laughs> in copious amounts, so, which of course ended with him spitting into the pillow. Never mind. <laughs> so, so these prayer flags I like is a mine. This this banner is mine. Uh, this is one of my favorite photographs of the morning. Uh, it's just so busy. There's so much happening. I think that's how it leaves your mind also. You know, once you've been through all this, you come back to so many thoughts. Are you there? So when you come back to the mountain, uh, to the base camp, uh, one of the things that... So Ethiopia, everybody played foosball. There were foosball tables everywhere. There's a village that won't have water, won't have... It won't have Coca-Cola, right? But it'll have a foosball table. Likewise, in Tibet, everyone played pool. You know, there were pool tables everywhere. So this is now, one has finished one's journey. You're back. It's very different, you know, and it's something that any traveler here would, uh, would agree with. Is when you start the journey and you see your destination. <coughs> and when you achieve that destination, you come back and you look at it afresh, you know. So suddenly it's not that elusive enigma anymore. One has been around that mountain. And uh, I do want to go back into the, like the actual Parikrama, which I missed the last time. Uh, maybe I will, maybe I won't. But uh, the intention is definitely there. So the, uh, the sum total of the lot of things that I've been trying to say today is that, uh, you know, I think part of that article that was written about this said that I'm not a very religious person, but by concatenation of circumstances I find myself shooting places of faith and people in situations of faith and religion and so on and so forth. It, like I said, happened by accident, it wasn't by design that I've visited places specifically for a certain religious practice or, you know, activity. Sometimes I think you're just driven by the faith of others. I think that is the quality of uh, you know, spiritual leadership, I think. Uh, or any kind of following that you do uh, of any person or any concept. It's to be driven by the drive that thing gives you. You, know, you watch people in that state of mind. It gives you a certain kind of... You may not believe in the same thing, but there's a certain patience that you acquire. Which is a direct consequence of what you've been seeing and experiencing. You know, as much as you are with five people <coughs> in a place like this, or 30 million people in a place like the in the Kumela, uh, or this random bunch of people that you find in Ethiopia, this lack of people again in Lonar, there is something about the magnetism of these places and the practices and the people who go there, which I find extremely fascinating. Uh, I will go back to the poem in 2025, for sure, if I am still around, I would love to go there, it would be my fifth poem. I would love to go back and finish the Parikrama at Kailash and try and find a way of travelling alone without 23 other people. Uh, the greatest challenge on that trip was actually the 23 people in there fussing. <laughs> it was really annoying. So I think that's part of the, the, the test. I think once you rise above that they didn't understand me at all. I mean, as much as I understood what their, you know, uh, uh, their 
obsessions were about comfort and food and so on, they could understand why someone like me, the moment we reach a camp where all of them, to a man, to a woman, would dive into their quilts, I had to pick up my camera bag and vanish, you know, into the night. Every day, uh, I think I have not slept as little as I did during my Kailash trip because I was always on the move. Um, photographing these places is also um, quite satisfactory. One, one misses the fact that, uh, like Swami Pravan, Pravananda spent oh, six months, sometimes a year living, you know, in Kailash and around. I'd have to spend a year sitting here and watching change, you know, through the seasons. Um, unfortunately, people like us get that one shot, you know, pun not intended. You're there for a day or for two days and you have to make the most of it. But it's all about uh, keeping alert and I, I find that every journey, every day there's that one photograph that sets, sets the rhythm of the day, you know. Uh, it happens by accident, it happens by design, it happens because you saw something the day before, uh, missed it and came back and got it right. Um, I think from every journey, if you come back with one good photograph, I think the journey was worth it. And uh, so far I've been lucky, I don't think I've, uh, you know, not come back with anything. Is there anything else? This is the last one. So, um, so, this was, I mean, if there's any questions anyone would like to ask about any of these things, I'd be more than happy to. So then. Traveling is a lot of fun. You can drive about drive or walk about 70% of the circumference of the top and about 70% of the circumference of the bottom. Only because uh, the top uh, doesn't have a plane and tapers into a cliff into a marble top. And at the bottom it's the foliage of the jungle. So you can't do the whole thing. There's a kacha path on top that you can drive. I did a lot of off-roading there in my jeep. Up and down. That was a joy of it. But it's mostly either on the periphery of the top or the periphery of the bottom. You're also not allowed there before sunrise and not after sunset because it's full of pools and other stuff. So they for your safety. Because I tried very hard to convince the Pandit ji to let me sleep in the Gandhi of the night. I said, 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 um, there's no alien theory, it was my theory that, that kryptonite looking shivling, you know, uh, yes. Mount Kailash. Um, there is some theory that believes it's a, it's a pyramid built by aliens. The same theory believes that even <coughs> the pyramids of Egypt were built under that same aegis of alien activity. Um, it's also the only unclimbable mountain range because of its sheerness. Uh, there was someone who offered to climb it 20 years ago, but it was deemed uh, an irreligious thing to do, to scale Mount Kailash. So it wasn't even finished. There was an expedition that threw the challenge of climbing it. But uh, there's another parikrama that you do of what is called the Inner Bora, which is the, the actual area around the it's, it's another mountain range and if you look at the photograph of Kailash from the top, then you'll understand what I mean, it's different. That only your seasoned mountaineer is not really not, you and I can't. Uh, you have got to show us your tattoo. Yeah, there it is. That's an angel from Ethiopian Orthodox Christian art. Uh, the only difference being uh, that in the paintings uh, that they are, Coptic. Uh, in the paintings, they form the periphery of uh, the, the activity. So, whether it's the birth, the death, or the resurrection of Christ, the angels will always, always be observers from different corners of the painting. And depending on what part of the periphery they're in, they're either looking up or down or sideways. They're always looking into the painting. Mine is just looking straight. That's the 
But these were done, it was done with the traditional uh, Ethiopian uh, uh, wooden tattoo thing. All the colors were original, uh, as taken from, sourced from the colors of their native art. And yeah, that's the tattoo. On the somber notes, the Kumbh Mila you mentioned was families that actually came with the idea of abandoning their own. Yes, yes. Is this something you heard or you knew happened to you? It's happened to you, it's happened to centuries. It's bizarre. Yeah, they take advantage of the cold and the, the, you know, the informed nature of the aged person and abandon them. So this something, and, and you talk of place of faith. So That's true. Place of faith yes, and Anything, anything. Yes, sir. How do you reckon the symbol of Sosika uh, travel all the way to Ethiopia in the church? And so, uh, apparently, the the, uh, the the earliest reference, I believe, of a Sosika is found in the Ukraine 12,000 years ago. Okay, now by the time, I mean, see, there are lots of theories. I've never been able to remember all of them because they're countless. What I did understand was that the clockwise swastika is... Uh, so it was a design element as, as well as representative of a, a form of human nature, I guess. So the anti-clockwise is meant to be uh, positive and the, the clockwise is meant to be positive and the anti-clockwise is sinners. So, uh, first of all, yes, the Manish brought this up. Uh, Ethiopian food is fantastic. Ethiopian food is absolutely spectacular. I don't know what delights you about traveling or the short of the day? Traveling. Traveling. Who is it? I think it was. It's the dinner at the end of the day. Sorry, at the dinner at the end of the day. <laughs> Especially if it's in Ethiopia. You said we talk about the food. Yeah. I think it was Jonathan Swift who said that it's not about traveling, it's about moving. <laughs> It's motion that keeps you happy, not just uh, happy. This 17 days, 17 days, uh, 19 days, 6 days going, 5 days going, 5 days coming, and uh, no, 6 days going, 6 days coming, 5 days from camp to camp for the Which month of the year? September. It was the last. Uh, Last one, September 2013. I would recommend it to everyone. Everyone should do this once in their life. The Swami Pranavanand, the, at the end of his book, makes a very interesting point. Even though it was written in the 40s, where I guess the concept of the metropolitan city or the urban you know, development as we know it today didn't exist did to this scale. But he very firmly says that every human being who lives in an urban situation should spend the last month of the year in the mountains to recharge, to calm down, to get some oxygen, to get his circulation going, to understand his place in the universe and then come back to daily life. He very clearly mentions it more than once. Is the book still available in Kathmandu? It's called Kailash Mansoor. It's not available. It's available only in that shop in Kathmandu. And I had a copy which I gave away to an uncle of mine because he was, he'd also done the Kailash trip in 91. He did in 91, I did it. It's now they're written in the 40s. It's like a Lonely Planet guide to Kailash Mansur, written in the 40s, where he talks of the journey from uh, uh, Almora, you know, from the Indian Himalayas straight to Kailash, which is the closest route also. It's actually a lot closer from here than from Tibet. And uh, he talks about which village has the best Zamindar who is the most. Uh, uh, Generous towards Yatris, Kailash Yatris. He tells you the, the places that you should carry guns when you lay your camps. Not necessarily ammunition, but the moment you lay your camp at dusk, you should fire the gun so that the coins know that you are armed. So, where to lay your tents, where to pull them out from, where to buy them, who sells, who gives complimentary grain, whose horses are the best. So, it's actually a very fascinating book. Coupled with all these experiences of you know, ice tracking and Snow melting and frozen shoals of fish and you know, frozen yaks and frozen mastiffs. Yeah, the dogs are beautiful. The mastiffs are just beautiful. Huge lion like things. So, Bhairav, as we know him, you know that animal face that we've seen across Tibetan Buddhism and Hinduism is not a lion, it's actually a mastiff. The mastiff was regarded by the Tibetans as a protector 
And the Bhairav in that animal form is actually a Mastiff. I had one very interesting experience with the Mastiffs. Uh, I'm very fond of dogs and I would befriend a dog at any given point in time. And throughout the journey I've been carrying biscuits and other knickknacks for the dogs and make friends with you know, all these huge, fearful looking dogs. But a dog is a dog, it really needs a biscuit and a tummy tickle and they're all absolutely fine. So there was one, uh, one town that we were going to stop at lunch on the way back. Uh, we were heading back to Kathmandu. And uh, the Sherpa, Aung Fui, Aung Fui, comes to me and says, Sir, if you don't mind, you know, that town that we're going to stop in for lunch today, <clears throat> would you please not play with the dogs there? So I said, why, what happened? He said, no, there are too many of them. And you know, last year our tourist was killed by them and they're very aggressive. And so I said, are you throwing me a challenge? He says, no, sir, just for my sake, please. This time, just, you know, get out of the bus, eat your lunch, sit in the bus and leave. Okay? So I said, okay, fine. So we reached this place and... Uh, it's a sunny day, it's about 11 o'clock in the morning, it's a very cold, very sunny day and it's a one horse town and there's about 16, 17 mastiffs uh, lying in the sun. So of course my antennae had immediately perked up, I went into the local shop. Uh, the Chinese make this thing, uh, I forgot what it's called, but basically it's a sweetened egg yolk bacon bun. Uh, can tart, I think it's called in, in Hong Kong. And there was a shop that was selling them pre-packaged and I bought a packet of 100. They were very cheap. So I've come out and I've sat on, on the ledge and there are these 17 mastiffs in front of me and all it took was one rustling of the packet to see all these ears breaking up. <laughs> and I opened the packet. Uh, some interest developed amongst the fraternity. Uh, three or four of them came closer. I opened the packet. Two, one, uh, one. It was eaten. The other guy sniffed the crumbs. More got up, and within I think another two minutes, I had mastiffs all around me. You know, with one head here, one under my arm, all nosing into the bag and me ripping open these packets. <coughs> At some point, I looked to the side and I saw Aung Fu Shepa standing there and doing this. <laughs> the seventeenth mastiff had no interest. He was the patriarch of the group, and he was still sitting in the sun and not interested. At all. So that particular dog then became my challenge for the day. And he looked gruesome. He looked like a tough cookie. You've seen a lot of battles in you know. He was the Chinggis Khan <laughs> of, of the canine fraternity in that village. So I've come to a safe distance and uh, I open one bun and I roll it gently towards him. He kind of stops about five inches or six inches from his face. He looks at me, he looks at this thing and his neck stretches, his tongue comes out and he eats it. <laughs> The second one lands about two feet ahead of him. So very reluctantly he crawls, you know, slowly and reaches out, plucks it, eats it. By the fifth one, he's eating out of my hand. It was done. But no photographs taken there? I have some photographs of the dogs, but not that. I was too busy feeding the dogs and being smothered by them. Sorry? Sorry? Five, that's it, dogs. Oh, no, that's it. So any questions about Ethiopia, about Lodar? It, uh, uh, Ethiopia, like I said, was somewhere I wanted to go from private for uh, reasons. Did you find Ethiopia? I found uh, the village, I couldn't find her, of course. Uh, went to Aksum. Uh, Aksum is the, uh, is the city of uh, the capital of the Aksumite civilization, which was the, like the warrior civilization of uh, Empire of India. How far from the actual metropolis? From Addis, Aksum must have been what, a two hour flight, one and a half hour flight. There were some places I went by bus, there were some places that you had to fly. I think going to Lalibela was fascinating because uh, standing at the airport, we, uh, I checked in and I had a rucksack. The tractor trailer comes out waiting for the flight and it's a five trailer luggage thingy and there was one trailer rucksack and the whole thing. There was just me, I was the only traveller from Lalibela travelling out back to Ethiopia. One of the things I must mention, I didn't put a photograph here, I completely forgot, is day one in Addis Ababa. I don't know how many people here are aware of uh, Lucy. Has anyone heard of Lucy? Australopithecus afarensis, the closest and uh, oldest humanoid skeleton to be found in uh, uh, an area called Afar, 
which is where she gets her name in Australopithecus, Afarensis. So the original skeleton is at the Smithsonian Museum, I believe, and they have a replica in the Ethiopian Museum of this Natural History. Here. I must say it's very interesting and very moving uh, moment to stand in front of the skeleton of the first human being, you know, a humanoid, where science and genetics have proved that every single human being on the planet has a gene in common with this particular skeleton. So everyone over here, or everyone in Bombay, everyone on the planet has a common gene with this individual. When you're looking at the skeleton of this woman and wondering if she had ever fallen in love, she had a family, she had a good life, you know, which she looked after. And these millions of thoughts went through my head looking at this tiny little skeleton of this person from my army millions of years ago. Wonder who she was. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do we have any more questions? Well, since, no, since digital has come, come upon us, draw is uh, unavoidable, but I've always found black and white more interesting. I mean, I'll put it very simply, if you look at, uh, if you look at a photograph of the Manslover Lake in color, it's just a little boring because it's, 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 it's blue and white and blue, you know, nothing happens with it. Black and white, you get these shades and layers and tones that that's also one step removed from reality, right? it's an abstraction of a real image, so it has its presence. I find black and white has a lot more presence. See, I, I had to also do work in color um, when I want to. But I think all this stuff was deliberately, I think, conceived in black and white also. I mean, gone are the days when you, you know, buy your black and white film, your color film and have your two cameras and, you know, those days have gone I miss those days. When you chose what to be with. I think the feeling of all of them is like a Yeah. It's special, it's different. Anaji, any questions? You're going to puncture my tires now tomorrow morning. <laughs> He's my neighbor, so. <laughs> Out of spite. Thank you, Thank you so much. much. You're welcome. Thanks. Dara, any questions? Come on. Bye, <coughs> when we take that trip together. Yes. <laughs> but I think one of the things one everybody should realize is that traveling has to be done with an open mind. I think someone said that if you if you disregard the food, the customs, the religion, the people of a country, then you might as well sit at home. You know, there's no point in going anywhere. Uh, you have to... Okay, let me tell you another funny story from Ethiopia since we haven't been thrown out. Have we been thrown out? Okay. There was... Uh, gone to Axum and there was this one restaurant that used to... Uh, Served food through the day. It wasn't a breakfast, lunch, dinner place. Kitchen was always open. So because of my erratic traveling and stuff, I'd always end up over there. It was really nice people. They'd come and talk to you and, you know, they made me try a local beer and they made me try a local wine. And uh, Ethiopian music is fantastic. And uh, I heard a lot of beautiful music there. Also brought some back which was playing while that uh, part was going on. And while chatting with these people one afternoon, uh, I said, okay, today when I go back to my hotel room before I come back to dinner, let me make you a CD of Indian music. So I had some things, I mean they like music that is vigorous, so I had some stuff like Talvin Singh and you know, Karsh Kale and all the, the, the slightly trancy Indian instrument, instrumental work uh, that people have been doing over the last couple of decades. So I made a couple of CDs and I gifted it to them. This must have been about 6 o'clock in the evening, I had gone for an early dinner because I had a flight in the morning. I've sat down to have a drink and uh, just looking at the laptop, going through the photographs of taking transferring them, etc. And my CD starts playing. One of the CDs I've given them starts playing in the restaurant. And uh, someone waves at me from a distance, another person waves at me from a distance. Some, one waiter who's serving me is called by one of the locals and the guy goes and walks around. Suddenly these three gentlemen get up and come towards me and say, Sir, we own this restaurant and it's been in our family for quite a few years. In all these years, you're the first person who's given us something. <laughs> you know, people come here and pay their bills and all that is very well, but you know, you've actually spent the time every day, we've been watching you, talking to our people and engaging with them. You've actually come back and given us something. So today, we're throwing you a party. <laughs> so suddenly, over an hour and a half, you know, half the village is there, 
the local band has arrived. Okay. <laughs> Suddenly from one innocent evening where I want to have a quiet drink and a quiet dinner and go back to bed, I just caught the flight. Yeah. Yes. You know, I was almost hanging on to the tail of the flight because that it just turned into this complete I, Ethiopian, you know, party. There was music, there was that dancing with everyone standing calm and locked and you know going out in circles and the live band playing and all these delicacies being cooked in the kitchen and being brought out and the owner pulled out some fabulous 21 year old scotch also. <laughs> it was fantastic but that's the way they were, you know, they were so warm and so affectionate. Made a lot of friends and I think three of them I'm still in touch with. Regularly, regularly in touch with. Do you miss the pen friend? I miss the pen friend. Aksum. Aksum was famous for its uh, monolithic pillars. So they used to make these 50 foot high pillars that they would excavate and carve 100 miles away and then roll them on logs of wood and elephants pulling them and horses pulling them to Aksum and then they'd make a ramp out of mud, they'd dig a hole, they'd put the pillar bottom up and these horses and elephants would drag them till it would topple into the hole. There are some hundred ropes that are being manned by a thousand people to keep the thing from falling. And then another bunch of people would just fill in those pits. So there's, uh, the Aksumite uh, pillars are very famous. There's in fact an Aksumite pillar park where there's only one pillar that has support. It has a full cage that's supporting it. Uh, Ethiopia is the only African country that was never colonized. And uh, they were invaded by the Italians for a bit. And I think for six years, the Italians have taken control of a couple of places. And that particular pillar had been stolen by the Italians and taken back to Italy. World War? Yeah, till yeah, 1943 or 44. Then Haile Selassie went to yeah. uh, So those who don't know, the word Rastafarian actually comes from the name, the actual um, uh, Abyssinian name, Ethiopian name for uh, Haile Selassie. Which was Ras Tafari. Oh. Ras means leader and Tafari was his name. So Ras Tafari, Ras Tafarians actually came from the actual Ethiopian name. Also, there must be some people here who remember the word Habshi. You know, we've I think grown up with uh, our grandparents or older people calling slightly darker people Habshis or you know, people they're not very fond of Habshis. So we discovered while I was there that Habshi is a der derivative of Habesha which is the Abyssinian word for Abyssinia. So, Habshi were actually Ethiopians who used to come to India for education and trade and you know, eventually as slaves. But uh, Habshi is actually Ethiopians. So, Habshi, Habesha, Abyssinia. That's where it comes from. So, that's it. You know, you travel and you pick up all these little bits of knowledge and information and you know, quotes of people and their habits and foods and customs and for me, it's always fascinating. I was just blend into whatever's going on and participate as much as I can. Which is why I'm happy today, you know, to be able to tell you stories uh, of personal experience. I don't think those other 23 travelers who went with me to Kailash had any nice stories to tell about their journey. They were so annoyed most of the time. The thickness of the quilt or the, you know, the liquidity of the kitchen. You know. <laughs> who got how much? Beg your pardon? Who got how much? Who got, uh, who got how much? Tell me if you were married, you really Let's say I've sacrificed some things in life to carry on doing whatever I've done. Why do you have a wife in every tourist destination, you know? <laughs> so, no, probably not. Like, they could never, they definitely not be able to go take photographs alone. No, like, what about traveling with a significant number of people? Like that? Well, that's different. That's different. Uh, I think as a, from what I do, the way I do it, I think the only way to do it is the way I do it. I don't think I'd be able to do it. I just, you know, there's just too much compassion for someone who's getting bored while you're waiting for some beam of light to peep from behind some pillar, you know. It's too much to expect of that person, you know. The photographers have a good laugh over there. <laughs> but it's perfectly true. I find it very difficult to not pay attention to that person who needs attention to that part of time rather than take a photograph. So I'd rather take the photograph and put the camera on my own. The moment you get into that, you know, responsible uh, towards other people situation, then you get a little uh, nice. Here I can get up whenever I want, I can leave whenever I want, I can stay whenever I like, you know, however long I want to. Um, 
Ethiopia was one of those pleasing trips, you know, I actually had gone for about 7 or 8 days, I ended up staying for about 31, 32 days. Um, I was supposed to come back from movie studio, that got cancelled, I had money in the bank, I just kept on traveling. I just kept on and on and every day was a voyage of discovery and um, it was fascinating. And I'm glad that happened, 32 days in northern Ethiopia was spectacular. And I still haven't seen half the country. The south is a lot more fertile and uh, Damon, since you asked me to ask, yes. ask why, why would you want these experiences not to inform your work? Why would you want them to be in a separate space, divorced from what you otherwise enjoyed earlier? Can it not begin, not maybe Bollywood, but why, why can it not begin to, or why should it not inform work? Why should it be separate from engagement? I think, uh, uh, I'll be perfectly honest here. I think uh, after that many decades in the film industry, I, I felt a level of disappointment that I do not enjoy. Uh, whether it's from situations, people, uh, experiences. No, I've understood that. What, I, what I'm trying to say is that because you have such a fund of uh, not just stories, but, but of interest in what you're doing. I think that, I think the what I regard as excavation of uh, what you're doing as opposed to just tourist guiding. That I think is quite missing from the work scene as it is. So I'm saying the attitude that takes you into these spaces and I think the treasures that you come away with as a result of your attitude to these spaces, I think we desperately need that cross-fertilization because as I think the more we begin to separate and reject, the less chance there is of the other growing into something more, more fruitful in a way. Okay, so what, what I've been doing over the years, and I just did a session uh, a couple of months ago, I don't enjoy being on set that much anymore. But I do enjoy going to the film institute and teaching them. Okay. So I just came back last month from a 15, almost 15 day workshop. It was a riot of fun. I think I was there without the baggage of my career, but the, the abundant knowledge to share. And all the classes were like this, you know, there was life explained through anecdote and cinematography explained through, you know, and I think it made those uh, boys understand a lot more. Uh, in, a, in an institute which is very dour and, you know, suppressive and... Uh, so I've managed to, uh, i managed to divert it there, you know. So the attitude that you see here and the kind of excavation that I do, I've transferred it now to younger people. From the experience that I've had as a cinematographer, which is you know, quite a lot, I've done yeah, two, I know, 2,000 hours, 3,000 hours of television, 15 movies and what, 700, 800 promotions over the last 30 years, uh, not counting documentaries and you know, other things. I would hate for me to pass on without you know, giving that to someone. And uh, I have Rubais here, I have Kunal here, I have Pavlika here to work with me. And all of them know that they are free at any point of time to ask them anything and get any help from me. Because it's nothing that I can take away, it's only something I can leave behind. And the fact that I was an untrained cinematographer, so that passion was different. You know, I'm making mistakes and learning and making mistakes and learning and not making mistakes, working harder, you know, not sleeping at night, palpitating, you know, worried, waiting for a negative report. Because I didn't have the, the benefit of an education to do this, you know, but I lost it. Everybody around you was palpitating. <laughs> <laughs> so I translate that down to uh, you know, teaching people as much as I can. Sir, yes, ma'am. Do you think that between the moving image and the still image, it's the fact that the still image gives you more authorship that if you don't connect to it in a person, personally invest in Definitely, it? definitely. I think uh, it's a very good question. Right? It's something that I've been feeling for a long time. But my Ability to be appreciated as a cinematographer ends up depending on too many people. Depends on how well the film does, it depends on the sensitivity of the director, it depends on whether the, the actor came on time, it depends on whether the, you know, the light went or didn't go or... Here it's me, you know, today you look at my photographs, you can, if you like them, you can tell me you like them. If you don't like them, tell me you don't like them, I'll take the credit, I'll take the blame. In the movies then it just became too tedious for me to say but you know, I, it's not even something I like doing, you know, but 
so and so came late on that day, so we had to shoot a sunrise shot at midday. You know, and I just got tired of it. I think I got tired of being dependent on so many people on a daily basis to get one thing done. I just find the duration of this much more you know, fulfilling. Yeah. It was. It was something like that. But even if you negate the whole process and the number of people, if you negate the number of people involved in the process, if you just about the still, like the still image and moving image. There's a separate level of concentration involved. Yeah, you've got to go in a state of zen. You've got to go in a state of zen. No, I completely agree. It's just that as of today, the person that I am today, I don't enjoy that. I have made, and I, I think I am known for it, that I make life very easy and very happy for people on set. Feroz Bhai is someone that I've worked with. The fact that he's here, he's the first director that I've worked with, has actually attended something that I'm doing. <laughs> and not for me. <laughs> So we're still talking terms and he loves me very much and I know uh, he knows how uh, you know barring throwing the thali of the caterer's face, I think that was the high point of uh, uh, <laughs> I think that's the only thing I did. That was for the good of the people. There was some other which I did not know. Oh, <laughs> 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 I think that's the only thing I did.